Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Steve Hansen. I'm the Vice Provost for International Affairs at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody today to our NATO Cyber Defense Conference, A Decade of Opportunities and Challenges. This is the official sideline event of the NATO Cyber Defense Pledge Conference 2021, and we're really honored to be part of it. We have an incredible program for you today. Uh, it will unfold in two sessions. The first session, NATO Cyber Defense and Offense in the International Environment, is going to explore how member states align their sovereign interests, capabilities, and cyber doctrine with NATO operational requirements and strategic ambitions. Our second session, Resilience and Supply Chain Cybersecurity Alliances and Partnerships, will address how NATO works with its regional partners, industry, and other third parties to meet the supply chain cybersecurity challenge. This is actually the second joint event that we've organized with William & Mary's Whole of Government Center of Excellence, NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, and King's College London Cybersecurity Research Group. And we are really looking forward to long collaborations with all of these partners. It's been an excellent uh, partnership thus far. William & Mary, for those who don't know us too well, uh, I like to point out we are the second oldest university in the United States, founded in 1693. Uh, we are sometimes known as the alma mater of the nation, and that's because our alumni early on included people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Monroe. And more recently, we continue to produce great leaders, especially in the national security space, including our current chancellor, Robert Gates, class of 1963, who, of course, was Secretary of Defense for two U.S. presidents. And... Uh, also, most, more recently, Jen Psaki, the current White House Director of Communications, is also a William & Mary alum, and we could go on. Our other partners are equally illustrious. CCDCOE is a NATO-accredited cyber defense hub focusing on research, training, and exercises. It represents a community of 29 nations, providing a 360-degree look at cyber defense with expertise in technology, strategy, operations, and law. The heart of the center is a diverse group of international experts from military, government, academia, and industry backgrounds. King's College London Cybersecurity Research Group is an intellectual hub for the study of cybersecurity in its political and strategic dimensions. It works closely with diverse scholars and practitioners to stimulate research and analysis of diverse cybersecurity issues, including cyber warfare, national and military cyber strategy, cyber espionage, and cyber diplomacy. And the William & Mary Center of Excellence in Whole of Government, uh, directed by Dr. Kay Floyd, who's with us today, is a center that brings interagency and multiple levels of government into dialogue to convene and do research on questions of national security that involve multiple partners. I want to note that our the product of our first event together, Cyber Threats and NATO 2030, Horizon Scanning and Analysis, is now available in print form for anyone who's interested in that previous wonderful event, and requests uh, for that can be sent to CCDCOE. We look forward to inviting you back to future projects in this line, and uh, we hope that you'll enjoy this one. I lastly want to mention that this event would not be possible without a grant from the U.S. Mission to NATO, for which we are really, really grateful. It's also my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Chargé d'Affaires ad Interim Douglas D. Jones. Let me say a few words about his amazing background. Douglas Jones took up his assignment as the Deputy Permanent Representative and Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Mission to NATO in August 2018 and became Chargé d'Affaires AI in January 2021. Mr. Jones was previously posted to the U.S. Mission to NATO as Deputy Political Counselor and served as Acting Head of the Political Section from 2008 to 2009. He also served in Washington, D.C. as Director for NATO and Western Europe at the National Security Council from 2010 to 2011. Before arriving in Brussels, Mr. Jones was Deputy Chief of Mission in Zagreb, Croatia from 2016 to 2018. And prior to that, he served in Washington, D.C. as the director of the Office of Peacekeeping, Sanctions, and Counterterrorism in the Bureau of International Organizational Affairs at the Department of State. Earlier assignments include Deputy Chief of Mission in Padgorica, Montenegro, and Senior Civilian Representative at the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Jalalabad, 
Afghanistan. He has also served on the U.S. delegation to the U.N. in New York and the Office of Israel and Palestinian Affairs at the Department of State. Other overseas assignments include Sarajevo, Dublin, and Tel Aviv. Mr. Jones holds a bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College in Maine and a master's degree in international relations from Princeton University. So please join me in a warm virtual welcome for Mr. Douglas D. Jones. Okay, I'm hoping you can hear me now. Perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, always appropriate when we have a conference on cyber defenses to have cyber difficulties, but we won't, we won't attribute it to any, uh, to any attacks. I think it was just more our own, our own technical challenges, but I was just thanking you, uh, Dr. Hansen, for your kind words uh, of introduction and uh, for your opening remarks. And I also wanted uh, to put a thank you out to Kay Floyd uh, for inviting me uh, to speak uh, to this group today. I did have the opportunity uh, yesterday to participate uh, in uh, most of the NATO Cyber Defense Pledge Conference, and I found it um, uh, a, a fascinating conversation and also an excellent forum for bringing together uh, government officials, policy experts, as well as uh, the private sector uh, to talk about these important issues um, and to talk about them uh, from the NATO context. NATO, as, a, as an alliance, uh, is responsible for the security of its now 30 members. And NATO is described as the most successful alliance in history. And one of the main reasons uh, for that is that NATO has constantly adapted throughout its history to address new security threats. I think um, as we meet this week, it's uh, a good idea to remember a good, one good example of those adaptations was actually following the September 11 attacks when uh, NATO recognized that threats uh, can emanate um, from uh, well outside of its own uh, area, even from the other side of the world in ungoverned spaces. And NATO decided uh, to go to Afghanistan uh, to address the terrorist threat. Um, I mentioned that because uh, two days ago, NATO decide, reached the historic decision to end its involvement in Afghanistan after almost 20 years. Um, but that was one example of how uh, NATO uh, recognized the changing security environment and how it needed to change to address security threats to its members. And that adaptation um, goes on today. And that's uh, part of why we're, we're meeting today, because NATO also is adapting to meet the security threats from new challenges like hybrid attacks, cyber attacks. Um, and so information technology, we all know, is transforming modern life, it's driving innovation, productivity, facilitating uh, sharing of ideas. Um, but even as it benefits, even with all the benefits it's brought uh, in bringing the global community closer together, we do have to recognize the security challenges it poses. And NATO, as we look at both the opportunities that this new technologies bring and the security challenges, NATO's focus is really on the second, on the security challenges and how do we, how does NATO adapt uh, to provide uh, security for its, its members. Allies in uh, 2016 made the cyber uh, defense pledge and that was to a pledge to enhance its cyber defenses of national networks and infrastructure. And it was made because we realized then that uh, state and non-state actors were increasingly using cyberspace uh, as a platform for irresponsible behavior and that we had to work, work better together uh, to improve our national defenses. And that's the second element, I would say, of the secret sauce of NATO and why it's been such a successful alliance. First being its adaptation, but second, because it's a place where we where like-minded allies can come and work together on difficult challenges. Uh, President Biden has been very clear uh, of the priority that he is placing on revitalizing America's alliances, starting with NATO. And the reason for that is the realization that even the United States, with all of its uh, capability uh, and power, cannot address all the security challenges alone. And we need to work together uh, with uh, our allies and partners uh, to be able to succeed 
uh, in the challenges we're facing. Um, and that's where NATO comes in on so many issues uh, where we can work together. Um, and we do need uh, to work together also uh, on the cyber challenge uh, to improve uh, our ability to defend uh, ourselves and our populations, whether that's attacks on uh, critical infrastructure, uh, attempts to undermine democracies and the rules-based order, uh, or even undercutting uh, fair competition by stealing ideas uh, by those who could not create their own. I think the pandemic has also uh, had a big impact uh, on uh, the uh, cyber challenges and really bringing them uh, to a head. Uh, in many ways, uh, it's one of the aspects that where the pandemic has accelerated uh, change that was already underway. And we've seen cyber cr criminals and malign actors uh, taking advantage uh, of the crisis and uh, to peddle disinformation, uh, often intended to undermine our health systems, to erode public confidence in democratic institutions, uh, even to try to sow rifts uh, among allies here at NATO. And at a basic level, it's also undermined, uh, underlined a lot of vulnerabilities um, that uh, we find in our interconnected world. We've seen um, many Americans and others around the world uh, struggling to access critical goods and services that show that our supply chains uh, need a major revitalization. We recognize this and President Biden signed an executive order in February that mandates a comprehensive review of US supply chains and directs federal departments and agencies to identify ways to secure the US supply chains against risks and vulnerabilities. And an important part of this review includes figuring out how we can work better with like-minded partners and allies as today's supply chains are so uh, complex and interconnected, uh, no one country uh, can secure them alone. And NATO is also taking action when it comes to supply chain cybersecurity. Uh, reducing supply risk in military supply chains is key aspect of the cyber defense pledge. And NATO continues to monitor the changing threat landscape in order to improve the collective cyber defense of the Alliance. It's also important, I think, to recognize that sustained malicious cyber activities below the level of Article 5, or in non-NATO speak, below the threshold of an armed attack, um, as, Was as the Washington Treaty states, is increasingly the new normal. Uh, so we are faced uh, with no black and white decisions, but often uh, must operate in an, in an area of increased ambiguity. And we should be thinking about the cumulative effects of these ongoing activities and how to respond uh, in addition to preparing uh, for the larger uh, cyber event. It's important also uh, when we talk about working together, I've talked about countries working together, um, and that's an important part of addressing the cyber uh, challenge. But we also need to work across sectors, not just countries. Uh, and we recognize that the private sector is going to play a critical role in determining how to increase the resiliency of supply chains in support of security, uh, the economy, and uh, our citizens. So I'm very pleased to see representatives, not only from different governments and agencies here, but also the think tank world uh, and the private sector here today, uh, because cybersecurity will require a whole of government approach and a whole uh, of sector approach. And only that way are we going to prevent and defend and counter threats in the cyberspace if we take this holistic approach. With that, with those remarks, uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, turn the floor back over uh, so we can hear uh, from our panelists uh, and uh, continue this uh, important discussion. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a warm thanks to both Professor Hansom and uh, Doug Jones, whom I salute from a distance and after a while. Uh, my name is Antonio Missiroli, and um, I am going to be the moderator for this uh, session. I used to be Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges at the NATO headquarters until a few months ago. 
Um, and now, of course, I am delighted to have uh, the privilege uh, and the honor to, uh, the pleasure, I would say, uh, to be part of uh, this conversation that takes place uh, in the immediate aftermath of the third uh, Cyber Defense Pledge Conference. Um, in my previous incarnation, I had the, 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 the fortune, the, the, the honor uh, to uh, launch this uh, annual exercise of the Cyber Defense Pledge Conference. And I'm uh, happy that despite uh, the pandemic, it has eventually been possible to hold this event in Tallinn after the two previous events on, uh, in Paris and, uh, and in London. Um, uh, yesterday was the, 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 the conference, yesterday was also the day in which the Biden administration took uh, uh, the decision to adopt sanctions uh, uh, against uh, Russian actors uh, following the solar winds cyber attacks of a few uh, months ago. And I think uh, this makes our discussion even more uh, important and uh, timely in this particular respect. This is a sideline event, but I think uh, uh, we will certainly have a frontline discussion, especially as this panel is expected to address uh, very, very uh, sensitive and topical issues that are related to uh, the way in which uh, member states, members of the alliance, align their sovereign interests, their capabilities, and their cyber doctrines with NATO operational requirements and strategic ambitions. So we will explore the consistency, the coherence, the compatibility, and potentially the synergy between different national doctrines and the way in which they play out in a NATO context. Uh, to um, hold this uh, conversation, we uh, have gathered a, a, a first quality, top quality panel that includes Dr. Brandon Valerian, who is Donald Brand Chair of Military Innovation at the Marine Corps University uh, and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, Dr. Max Smith, who is a senior researcher at the Center for Security Studies uh, in uh, Zurich. And uh, Ami Ertan, who is a PhD candidate with Royal Holloway at uh, the, the University of London, and I understand he is in uh, Tallinn right now. So many thanks to the CCD COE for making this event possible. And without any further ado, I will give the floor to uh, Dr. Valeriano, who I think will elaborate in particular on the US doctrine and how it is being implemented uh, bef before and especially now under uh, the Biden administration. So Dr. Valeriano, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, it's early in the morning in the US, but uh, I'm wide awake and uh, ready to go. And uh, as was just mentioned, uh, my prime task is to talk about US strategy. And I think the first thing to note about US strategy is that it evolved from restraint and deterrence. It hasn't given up on restraint and deterrence but there are new concepts and new ideas that have been added to what U.S. cyber doctrine is over time. Defend forward and persistent engagement are not paradigm shifts away from what has happened before, but instead continuations of past policies. Persistent engagement is often a buzzword that's used in the community. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is that there's no clarity on to, as to what it means. Um, as far as I know, and as far as I can tell from official documents and official statements, it's really about superiority through persistence and about seizing and maintaining the initiative in cyberspace by continuously engaging and contesting adversaries to cause them uncertainty where they maneuver. And persistent engagement remains as the operational implementation of Defend Forward. Defend Forward is the overarching U.S. concept and cyber doctrine. And the simple way to remember Defend Forward is that it's about preemption, it's about defending, it's about deterrence. Uh, the, the U.S. Department of Defense will counter cyber campaigns threatening U.S. military advantage by defending forward to intercept and halt cyber threats by strengthening cybersecurity systems and the networks that support DOD missions. So what's important about Defend Forward is not just that they, uh, the U.S. will operate in a forward persist, uh, position to intercept cyber threats but that the defend forward concept as articulated by the DOD is about building trust with the private sector. It's about building alliances and supporting our allies. And finally, it's about reinforcing norms. And I think a lot of people forget 
that the articulation of defense forward by the Department of Defense is very clear about the need for alliances and partnerships. Now, the second point would be where does U.S. strategy need to go? Because where we are right now is clearly not good enough, as we saw from yesterday's events and as we see from the continuous activities uh, leveraged against uh, the United States and its NATO allies. Um, one thing that's very exciting and hopefully will be a positive step forward is the nomination of Christopher Inglis as the first national cyber director. And this was an important recommendation of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which I was part of, because there needs to be someone to coordinate U.S. power. Quite often, U.S. power in cyberspace is only leveraged through the Department of Defense or only articulated by the Department of Defense. And obviously, cyber power should maintain and coordinate all levers of U.S. national power. And there should be someone who should coordinate with allies in international institutions. And the hope is that the National Cyber Director will be that person. So this is something to watch out for. This is something to pay attention to. This is something to watch as the confirmation process goes on. Um, the Solarium strategy that we articulated to push the U.S. doctrine forward was called layered cyber deterrence. And we hope that it will be adopted and we'll see how that will go in the future. But the idea was to articulate three layers. The first layer was to shape behavior that nothing can happen in cyberspace unless there is the development of normative regimes regimes that govern cyberspace in collaboration with international partners. Shaping behavior should leverage non-military instruments such as regulation standards and legal regimes to produce cyber stability. So if we're gonna act in this domain, we need to shape the domain in a way we want it to behave. So shaping behavior is key. The second layer would be to deny benefits, which is a key part of deterrence. And it focuses on resiliency and defense in depth. It's about securing elections, protecting critical infrastructure, and ensuring the continuity of the economy and the government. And the third and final layer is to impose costs. Um, the idea is that we need to generate and enhance US cyber capabilities to orchestrate a whole nation approach to defend the nation through forward action and cost imposition. This requires the US government to work with its allies and partners to leverage cyber power to achieve effects. The third point is about the implications for NATO. US cyber strategy is not perfect. It's confusing. It's confusing internally. There's a lot of disagreement as to what policy is, and a lot of people don't actually read the statements. And uh, I think an important thing to watch moving forward is what testimony is said, what people actually say, and actually how the United States behaves. But I think the first thing we need more of is signaling. We need more coordination. We need more clarity as to what the United States expects and how it's going to operate. And along with that, the United States needs a clear declaratory policy. Because every few years, there's a cyber event that changes what we think is critical and important, from the Sony attack in 2014 to the Russian election hacks of 2016. We are finding new and important avenues to protect and to defend. But there needs to be clarity as to what is off and on limit. And that is not clear right now. There needs to be more work on norms. Uh, the United States has been a key protector and supporter of the UN normative process as uh, articulated through the group of government experts and the open-ended working group. But the problem is, is that there's no coordination between what the State Department is doing and what U.S. national policy is. So while the United States is important as a defender of norms, the clear need is to ensure that these normative ideas filter their way up to the top of government. And I'm just not sure we're there yet. The next thing we need is escalation management. I think too many people misunderstand the points that academics are making about escalation, particularly people like me. And it's not that we're saying that escalation cannot happen, but that if escalation were to happen in cyberspace, it needs to be managed in a certain way. 
we need to be aware of these processes and we need to be aware of these triggers. And quite often escalation can happen in cyberspace and it often does happen because the United States is the one who can and will escalate. So we need to be careful about the steps that are taken in order to ensure security because they can invoke the security dilemma causing more conflict in the future. Finally, we need more coordination. If we don't know what U.S. strategy is internally, how are allies expected to know what U.S. strategy is? How are our partners expected to know what U.S. strategy is? We need a clear strategy and a clear doctrine articulated by the Biden administration as soon as the national cyber director is put into office. My last set of remarks are about what can be learned from the U.S. approach. What the U.S. has done very, very poorly is evaluation and metrics. We need to do better as a community to think about assessments of cyber strategy and doctrine. We can't just have new doctrines every few years that have little connection to reality, that have little connection to evaluation. That's why the United States is in the position it's in in Afghanistan, because we haven't thought enough about assessment and metrics, and we need to do better in cybersecurity. We need to learn to signal and collaborate. It's not a solo domain, and the United States quite often acts as if it is. There needs to be better coordination with NATO and its allies. And finally, we need to coordinate better on norms. Just saying that the UN GGE set of norms adopted in 2015 are the norms of cyberspace does not make them the norms. Norms are enfranchised by practice, not just ideas and statements. There needs to be clear behavior and stable behavior in cyberspace, and the United States can and should lead the way. But there needs to be more clarity in U.S. strategy, and I look forward to the ev further evolution of U.S. strategy as the Biden administration gets its feet uh, under the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Valerian, also for highlighting not only the main traits of the U.S. strategy as it is developing and the fact that it is in many respects, a work in progress, as it is also elsewhere, but also for uh, pointing out the, the importance of imposing costs and also the dilemmas that may be related to imposing costs, in particular, uh, insofar as the risk or potential for escalation is concerned. So without any further ado, we'll pass on the floor to Max Metz, who I expect to deal with uh, a sort of comparison uh, between uh, uh, allied approaches to uh, cyber defense uh, and their potential impact on NATO. So, Max, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Miserori, and it's a real pleasure to participate uh, in this panel. Um, here's the key point that I would like to make, that over the past few years, we have seen a convergence among NATO members about the importance of developing a cyber posture. Yet we have seen a divergence among NATO members as to what this cyber posture should look like. And these growing differences in cyber postures across states can significantly impede on NATO's ability to effectively operate in the cyber domain. So when I talk here about cyber postures, I'm referring to three elements, strategic goals, operational capacity, and legal understanding. So let me first briefly talk about this idea of convergence, right? Member states basically all agree on the critical need for a coherent cyber policy. Um, basically all have uh, developed a cyber uh, security strategy, cyber defense strategy, and some states have published updated versions uh, over the years to reaffirm their cyber security um, as, as an issue of national security importance. Um, they have tweaked institutional responsibilities or they have articulated changes um, in the threat landscape. In addition, at least since 2018, most NATO allies now have officially established either a command or a unit, unit with its mandate to conduct cyber effects operations based within the military. And on the legal point, yes, there is a shared recognition that international law applies in cyberspace. And of course, these developments have both been reflected in and aided by policies made at the NATO level. Uh, we can, for instance, think about the Cyber Defense Pledge in 2016, um, the establishment of the uh, Cyber Operations Center in 2018, or the Allied Joint Doctrine for Cyber uh, Operations uh, last year. Yet when it comes to the direction of Allies' cyber policy, we see growing differences, um, especially in the development and deployment of offensive cyber capabilities. So let's first think about this capacity aspect. So even though most states now have or are in the process of establishing a cyber command, 
the operational capabilities vastly differ across states. So whereas we have seen some governments who are increasingly allocating significant resources to cyber operations and are really starting to see the benefits of these investments, these potential cumulative benefits, actually the majority of allies still run their cyber commands on a budget of literally a few million a year. And I would argue potentially and likely insufficient for effective operations in the cyber domain. And second, until a few years ago, NATO member strategic visions were very much aligned. National cybersecurity strategies shared a common threat focus, primarily focused on activity above the trash of the bomb attack. Um, and um, you can also say there was a largely unified vision to address the threat with a principal focus on this conventional notion of deterrence. This changed, of course, with the publication of the US DOD strategy and the cyber command uh, vision um, as well. And as Dr. Valeriano mentioned, the US strategy now emphasizes also the need to cause friction wherever adversaries maneuver, operating globally, continuously and seamlessly below the threshold of armed attack. That's not necessarily, or that's not the language you will see in uh, the documents of at least the continental European uh, powers. And so whereas deterrence is about changing adversaries cost benefit calculus, uh, a big part uh, of persistent engagement is also about taking the opportunity away of the adversary to act. And the third point on the international legal aspect or the legal aspect. So NATO members positions on how international law applies and particularly the obligation of states vis-a-vis -vis sovereignty are now more divergent than a decade ago. Whereas countries like the Netherlands and France and more recently Germany are located on the side of sovereignty as a rule camp. Um, the United Kingdom has at least the most explicit position that a remote cyber operation by one state into another's cyber systems or network doesn't violate the latter's sovereignty. Now, some may argue that these differences are merely the result of a lack of maturity of some states. Some haven't caught up to the latest development. Um, but this assumes a single path to maturity and that these dynamics of cyberspace maybe pull all states in the same direction. Um, and it would suggest that even without major policy coordination, allies cyber policies will converge over time. I think a more persuasive understanding of the current threat is that even though states can learn from each other's institutional progress, differences do not merely stem from states maybe lagging behind. These states are on a different policy path. And this means it requires real dedicated and sustained policy attention at a minimum and potentially more significant coordination to bring these states closer together. So where do we go from here? A couple of points that, uh, that Dr. Valeriano mentioned, I, I fully agree with, um, such as the, um, the, the, like actually let me start with one, uh, such as the importance for actually clarification. So yes, the US might be not fully clear and there might be internal divisions or uh, lack of clarity sometimes as to what is exactly meant, but it at least has pushed a policy proposal out there and several and set up a Solarian Commission to really think through some of these strategic issues. Many states today really, I would say, have to still go through a process of uh, intellectual and strategic development to really think through where they stand on a strategy perspective as well as also on a legal perspective. And so the first point to make is really one around clarity. Um, it's making sure that people, that, that states have a clear understanding of what actually their ends and ways and means are in this uh, domain. There are also, as, as Dr. Valeriano mentioned, great opportunities for further coordination and collaboration. Um, one point that I've previously made and I very much believe, uh, still believe in is this notion of a potential notification equity process. States have to be clear if they want to operate in each other's networks potentially and even cause effects as to when they are and when they're not going to do that. What are the equities involved that makes them potential, uh, makes them uh, consider whether they would do that um, or not. Um, the second point uh, to point out here is on to what degree capability development is an option. We have kind of moved away from the idea that it is possible at all. And hence NATO have talked to, has talked about uh, integrating cyber effects. We're not talking about integrating capabilities. That's very understandable, particularly if you look at the potential for collaborating on uh, exploit and tool development, which is incredibly hard. 
uh, for the variety of disincentives that exist. But I think there are other options. And of course, NATO CCD COE is partaking in some of them, such as exercises. I think it can be extended. But infrastructure more broadly, particularly around cyber ranges, there are opportunities that I think are still unexplored here. And we do NATO and NATO members really well to look further into that. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting the, the dual and parallel process of convergence and potential divergence. I have to say that in my uh, previous job, I could uh, notice myself the huge uh, increase in interest and investment on the part of most allies, I would say all allies, in uh, cyber defense. Uh, but it is also clear that that kind of uh, uh, investment and that uh, uh, um, uh, increase uh, has uh, been built on pre-existing strategic approaches that have not changed very much still. And I think that that is probably a sort of a legacy of the recent past. And I think uh, the, the, the process of adaptation, if I may borrow again from uh, Doug Jones uh, in his introductory remarks, is going to continue both at the uh, allied uh, and the national level. Um, without any further ado, now the floor goes to Ami. And I understand that she will continue along these lines of comparison with a special focus on the UK approach to that. So, Ami, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. Um Yes, I'm going to go through the UK's approach to offensive uh, cyber activity, how that's situated along uh, the UK's allies and what that means for NATO as well. So when we talk about the UK approach, we'll be talking about the National Cyber Force, the NCF, uh, NCF the dedicated joint military intelligence unit that um, is part of the UK defence and security strategy to uh, detecting, disrupting, deterring uh, adversaries through the use of cyber offensive activity. Now, it was formally unveiled uh, November last year and outlined in more detail through the UK's integrated re uh, review this March. But broadly, it has a huge scope, countering uh, terrorist activity, serious and organised crime, uh, as well as uh, hostile state actors, uh, their behaviour in cyberspace. And the way that the NCF has been uh, coordinated, what is said about it, raises a number of considerations. Uh, first, of course, the huge scope. The matter of the fact is that, like many other states, the UK is resource constrained. Um, how does the UK choose what to prioritise? What threats to prioritise? How to engage at what level? Will it be more persistent, low-level counter uh, counter activity, or will it be uh, kind of more direct, more active engagement that mirrors more closely, for example, something like persistent engagement? There are huge themes that the UK faces, which are not unique to them, of course. International law, as others have mentioned, uh, the applicability of of norms, uh, permissible and non-permissible environments, uh, what exactly can be done, and of course, questions around uh, ethics, humanitarian law, uh, and some of these kind of not broadly military terms too. And of course, once more, the UK isn't developing their offensive capabilities in a vacuum. While the UK is, of course, acting to prioritise their goals, their missions, their defence objectives, they will have to bear in mind the postures, uh, the strategies, the doctrinal approaches taken by their allies uh, and alliances that they're a part of. So this means bearing in mind uh, the approach that the US has taken, uh, allies across the, uh, Europe, NATO, of course, and then other structures like uh, intelligence sharing, the Five Eyes Network as well. And these approaches differ. You have, of course, the US, uh, extremely uh, close allied relationship. How far will the UK choose to align itself with persistent engagement and the strategy that uh, continues through the Biden administration? You have the fact that many of the UK's allies take a very different approach and have different understandings of offensive cyber. You have France, who draws a very clear distinction between offensive and defensive activity. You have Germany, who is much more cautious uh, relative to some other states and has constitutional constraints on military cyber operations. You have states, as, as others have mentioned, who have very different definitions of what constitutes offensive cyber activity, uh, Norway and uh, the Netherlands being two examples. So this is a challenge for the UK to situate itself, um, but also for alliances like NATO, which will have to address the divergent constitutional 
legal doctrinal approaches uh, taken by these states, all of which are NATO members. So that has implications operationally through the activities of the Cyber Operations Center uh, at NATO, but also at this norms, uh, this strategic and, and doctrinal level, as others have mentioned. And I think this presents an opportunity for NATO as well. NATO as a consensus-driven organization, uh, NATO as a consensus-building organization that has the capacity to provide this platform for states to come together and start or continue um, kind of driving and amplifying productive discussions on, for example, how does what, what does responsible state behavior in cyberspace look like specifically around cyber operations? Uh, how should international law apply, uh, especially as others have mentioned around uh, and below the threshold of armed conflict? Uh, what norms can, can we go to? And I think there's huge motivation for the UK uh, to cooperate in this manner. And they've been quite open in doing so, being uh, the first NATO ally to state they'd contribute to the NATO Cyber Operations Centre. Uh, they've stated explicitly they want to abide by domestic and international law and expect other states to do the same. Going back to the point I made uh, at the very beginning about the fact that the UK is resource constrained and will have to pick and choose what it prioritises. Uh, other states have the same, even the US uh, has this to a degree. And this makes sense that cooperation using a vehicle like NATO um, to agree on common conceptions, terminologies, but also in terms of that operational uh, leverage one, uh, at one point um, does make sense. We have the, the capacity and I think consensus building takes time. We know from wider discussions on cybersecurity how long it takes even to agree on definitions. Uh, so now is the right time to really start putting the pressure on here. Thanks. Antonio, uh, can you unmute, please? There is something that happened without my awareness. I would like to thank uh, Amy again for giving, uh, in particular, UK perspective of all, or for commenting also on the other two presentations. And as already announced at the beginning, I'm extracting a little bit uh, comments and questions from the uh, chat column and adding one myself. I will list the four, three main points I would like the three panelists to address. The first one is um, in part related to what Max in particular was trying to highlight, is the need for some clarification also in terms of uh, approaches and the terminologies related to that. That is a, an ongoing process, but I think uh, there is more work to be done. As you know all too well, NATO has uh, agreed uh, not long ago a mechanism for uh, as we say, integrating sovereign cyber effects provided voluntarily by allies. It is a sort of complex language uh, that to some extent covers the issue of offensive cyber. So what is offensive cyber? Because I have always noted a certain uh, reluctance to use this term, and perhaps it's due to the fact that offensive may mean different things to different people. Uh, both in terms of public opinion uh, and, and governance, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, cyber experts in this particular field. So we'd like to have your take on what you think offensive cyber could mean and how and to what extent it could be used, whether it is a predominantly preemptive action against potential attackers before hostile action is taken, or it could also imply a degree of first use, as it is uh, uh, um, uh, normally considered possible also for other domains in this particular respect. The second point is uh, uh, a question coming from uh, the attendees. It is how uh, you panelists would see the emergence uh, that it seems likely of a sort of uh, bipolar cyberspace. And I would say bipolar in all possible senses of the term not only in the geostrategic, but also in the other more psychological and, uh, and, uh, and natural uh, senses of the, of the term. And third, uh, a, a point that uh, I consider particularly relevant uh, in, this, uh, in this context is the extent to which the imposition of credible costs, that is something I would say an increasing number of allies agree upon, um, would uh, uh, permit to control and manage potentially uh, escalatory effects, uh, because that is probably one of the big dilemmas. Also, as we speak, I mean, the decisions that have been taken that also fall uh, outside of the uh, specific cyber domain, and also uh, the intent to impose costs, but without, I suppose, 
uh, generating or triggering or justifying an escalation. So it would be interesting to hear uh, your, view, your points of view on this. Please be concise and feel free to pick any question among the three uh, you prefer. I will go in the same order as the presentation was made, so I will start with Dr. Valeriano. Well, thank you. Um, on offensive cyber, I, I reject the term. Uh, I, I don't find a distinction between offensive and defensive weapons in cyberspace to be a particularly helpful or useful for the conversation. Um, and it's long been known in international security literature that there is a distinction problem, that you cannot distinguish between offensive and defensive weaponry. And I think that we are distracted quite often by this offense-defense term, which really doesn't have much applicability in cyberspace. Um, in terms of bipolarity, um, I think we are moving more towards bipolarity or the bifurcation of the internet between the United States and the West and Russia and China. Um, that's not something to fear necessarily, but a balance of power has traditionally been associated with war, not peace. And the advice of realists has always been empirically wrong. So a bipolar system is something to be avoided if we can. And that means coordinating with uh, Russia and China in, in the future and finding ways to work with them so they do not split off more into the future. And finally, on credible costs, that also requires coordination, both internally and externally. And quite often, I think most states resort to economic sanctions, as the United States did recently. And that's just not enough to establish credible costs. It's not enough to establish credible commitment, as we might say. So if we really want to deny and stop certain behaviors, we have to be very clear on what we're trying to stop and have to be very clear on the consequences for said action. And I don't think the international community and particularly the United States has been very clear so far. Thank you. I think Max, it's your turn, your take. Thank you. So on the need of clarification, uh, I agree with uh, with the point that was earlier made. I mean, the difficulty here of distinguishing distinguishing here between defense and offense is very uh, very hard. And let me add, of course, we know of many of the discussions on the arms race, uh, the the need for a cyber weapons arsenal, uh, all of those kind of things. But in the end, what we're really talking here is a set of linked activities when we're talking about cyber operations that may or may not use certain tools to gain access and to subsequently achieve an effect. And so this kind of components um, uh, are much more almost, yeah, are, are a set of activities rather than real goods. And uh, that changes also our understanding of how cyber commands uh, operate. Um, on the Bipolarity and the, the the of the internet and then the move. Clearly, we are seeing a um, ever more um, bipolar or tripolar uh, world. Um, but let's add here as to what is relevant. It's actually a really broad space that is relevant here. Take an example of even the gaming industry that can have implications. Um, what do I mean with that? Um, if you have a Chinese company uh, like Tencent, which is, to my knowledge, and I'm not a, a very good gamer, uh, the biggest gaming company in the world, and it has it has its software downloaded on 20%, if not more, of the mobile phones um, in the world, um, the implications that that may have as to uh, what kind of information can be collected is um, enormous. I don't see that that kind of bifurcation, however, will significantly change in the future. Um, China and Russia will be uh, dependent on uh, US uh, software and hardware and uh, the other way uh, around. Um, the lastly, on the imposition of credible costs. So it's important to be clear on what activity is not allowed, uh, as was mentioned, but it's equally crucially important to be clear on what activity is allowed. And it's perhaps there that we are sometimes not really having the discussion that we need to have. Yes, indeed. And of course, the, the between espionage and sabotage, there is a gray zone in cyberspace uh, that perhaps has not been clarified yet. Ami, your turn. Sure, I'll, um, I'll work backwards. I uh, agree on imposition of costs, especially at the lower levels, uh, things that aren't covered by law of armed conflict. Um, it's this, it's this incredibly grey area, and I think that's a problem, especially as states do start building out and cementing these capabilities. 
I don't have too much to add on the second point about, you know, bifurification, um, other than, again, it's potentially this driver for cooperation, better together. And then on the point between defining and, and kind of lack of consensus on what even is offensive and defensive cyber, that will always be there, I think. And I agree that theoretically it's not hugely helpful when anyone can kind of move the goalposts and draw their own lines to suit their own purposes. Um, I think it is pragmatically helpful to talk about when you just think about where states are investing, the kind of capabilities that they're developing, um, and the resource split as well. I think um, Jason Healy's got an interesting piece on what he calls the offense-defense balance and how states might uh, choose to appropriate their resources differently between them. Um, so I think, I think that's quite interesting in, in pragmatic terms, but I do agree with the other panelists on the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. My understanding is that our time is already up because this is very, very tight uh, panel and conference. And therefore, I will uh, thank you all uh, the panelists and thank those uh, attendees in particular who uh, asked uh, questions or made comments. Uh, apologies for those who cannot be considered for reasons of timing. Let me just add that it has been a pleasure to participate in this uh, discussion myself. And I think that this is a discussion that has to continue. I'm sure it will continue inside the Alliance, especially in view of NATO 2030 and the June summit that is already in the offing. And I expect a lot uh, from uh, what is going to be deliberated on that occasion, uh, also in view of the possibility of uh, opening a discussion on uh, reviewing the strategic concept that dates back to 2010, which in cyberspace terms is uh, ages ago. And I think it is uh, the time is probably ripe uh, for doing that. It is certainly true that uh, allies have made a lot of progress uh, collectively and individually over the past few years in this domain, that a lot still has to be done, that uh, national administration and governments uh, make still different trade-offs between the different elements uh, of cyber defense and also the ability to deter uh, at the global level. I would say that a lot happens not only at the NATO allied level or at the national level, but also bilaterally and among the groups of states in terms of cooperation, assistance and alignment. And I think this is an element that should not be underestimated in our discussions. And uh, honestly, I think that the whole discussion about how to impose cost, how to uh, um, impose also common rules of behavior at the international level, not only among states, but also involving also those non-state actors that can be brought to some uh, degree of discipline in this particular aspect is going to be key uh, in the uh, months and the years ahead. And I think that uh, NATO should and will remain an important platform for um, bringing forward this discussion and potentially also for developing a truly common approach to all the, these issues. There are also other fora, uh, the G7 and, uh, and also the United Nations, of course, where these issues have been discussed, but it's important that first and foremost, a degree, a higher degree of convergence is reached among allies and like-minded countries also beyond the, um, the, the remit of the alliance itself. There are other countries out there that think alike and they should be brought on board and contribute to this discussion. So many, many, many thanks to all of you and um, over to the guest, Piret. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Uh, if I may, we still have five minutes, so I would like to pick one question. Uh, from the chat box uh, to all panelists and all, Antonio also for you. Uh, and I will read it. What will be the effect of non-state actors have on the cybersecurity policy in the future? And perhaps you could elaborate it on the context of allies and partners. Thank you. So we have more what, five minutes until the break. Okay, I can only pass on the question to the panelists. Uh, same order of speakers, and of course, there are many, many types of non-state actors. I hope you agree with that. Uh, Randall. Perfect. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think there's two things that we need to think about in terms of non-state actors. One, when we start to think about normative regimes and norms in the international system, we need to think about third-party actors, about private military corporations. And as we see more evidence of the malicious behavior of these groups, we need to start to think that it's not just the states that are the ones that can and will be the problem. 
that it's going to be these private military companies, these private cyber companies that are going to be more of the concern into the future. It's not going to be about cyber terrorism, but about the capabilities of private threat actors. And I don't think this space is entirely regulated or monitored, monitored enough as of yet. Now, in terms of non-state actors for the United States and U.S. policy, um, the U.S. has always paid lip service to the idea of public-private uh, cooperation, but it's never actually sought to functionally achieve it. And the hope is with the DHS and the rise of CISA as part of the U.S. government uh, apparatus that we can move forward functionally towards cooperation. But as I've mentioned, up until this point, it's really been something we've talked about but not done enough. And clearly most of the capabilities and most of the infrastructure in cyberspace is governed and controlled by the private sector. So these form of non-state actors need to be uh, paid attention to, and there needs to be clear cooperation and coordination, which isn't happening just yet. Max? Let me uh, use the same distinction that uh, Dr. Valeriano used. Um, the first one on, um, on the need to, um, to, to control potential proliferation that may come and exist through the use of non-state actors or the fact that non-state actors may conduct operations for, uh, for state actors. Uh, much of this discussion today has been framed in an international framework. Uh, we've talked about the need for uh, potential uh, arms control statements or other international legal uh, discussions, but I think much of it actually starts at home and states haven't done that sufficiently. We have to think about potentially people leaving cyber commands, intelligence agencies, and starting to work in the Middle East or in another country and potentially using their acquired skills uh, somewhere else. Now, much of that, I think, can be counter-proliferated um, at home rather than uh, through some kind of international agreement. And we have seen very little discussion on that. Uh, secondly, um, as Dr. Valeriano mentioned, it's this importance of collaborating on the private sector given the ownership of infrastructure. The moment you move out of your own networks, you're into someone else, and that network tends to be the private sector. Um, there are no clear, um, in some cases, there could be uh, domestic discussion going on, but there is very little uh, international discussion there as to what will happen if uh, a U.S. government entity hits a box of a... Um, um, Danish uh, private company, and I think that is something where um, at least some clarification is required. Thank you. And Amy? Sure. Um, I'll take the slightly different approach and, and look at um, the categories of threat that the UK, the, the National Cyber Force, said they're going to address. Uh, so apart from hostile state actors, we're looking at terrorists and serious organised criminal groups. And, you know, the examples that the UK uh, gave was uh, offensive activity could be, uh, you know, interfering with a terrorist phone to stop them contacting their colleagues or uh, preventing the internet being used as a platform for, you know, serious crime, in including, you know, child exploitation. And apart from that offensive activity, I think the second part is bringing those people to justice. So in terms of wider cyber strategy, it's harmonization of law enforcement internationally. It's intelligence sharing. It's all these other huge themes uh, in cyber security, cyber intelligence um, that need to be talked to as well. So offensive cyber activity is just one tool that will form part of any government's defense uh, of cyberspace. Couldn't agree more, and I think that it should be, at any rate, uh, part of a broader spectrum of uh, instruments to be used uh, or to be threatened to be used in this particular uh, context. And with the consideration made by Max that uh, cyber defense begins at home, I think we are not only concluding uh, this uh, the work, uh, the discussion of this panel, but also offering a perfect assist to the next one that is devoted to resilience. So thank you again. Piret, over to you for real this time. Thank you very much.